More than 250,000 years ago, he was one of 400 tribes who controlled this continent. He has been called Indian for only 500 years. The Europeans came and named him Indian and brought him gifts. Europeans came and named him Indian and took a continent away from him. Those who survived were pushed westward toward the sea. At a creek named Wounded Knee, 300 Sioux, men, women, and children surrendered and were gunned down by the United States 7th Cavalry. The year was 1890. It was the last battle to be fought. To the Indians, Wounded Knee was not 1890, but the moon when the Indians were told they no longer existed. The fighting was over. The buffalo, gone. Tribes reduced by warfare, disease, famine were moved off their lands onto reservations. They became special charges of the government of the United States. Prisoners of war. They were dominated by a federal agency originally a division of the War Department, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the BIA. From birth to death, the Indian's land, his schools, his jobs, his health, his last will and testament were determined by the BIA. The American Indian was taught to forget his past, his birthplace, his heritage. He was forced to depend solely on the government, urged to assimilate peacefully into the white society. Today, most of the more than 750,000 descendants of the first Americans continue to live on reservations. The rest are trying to assimilate. Miles away from their land, their roots, their home. Indian first gets off the bus, he's absolutely lost, absolutely mazed with the size of the city, and it's just organized confusion. At the very moment he steps off that bus, where does he go? Does he turn north, south, east, or west? And if he turns there, what's he going to find? It's just absolute and utter amazement and fright. Because you know no one. You can walk 15 or 20 miles in any direction and probably not meet a soul that you've ever seen in your life before. 
The young Indian coming in off the reservation hits the street and he discovers he's in a great big city, the biggest he's ever been in in his life. He comes in in western clothes. He has a lost expression on his face and everybody knows he's a newcomer. It's, it's a new place. It's something, you know, that you have to conquer. And yet, uh, you're sort of bewildered, confused, because you don't know what to do next. You're afraid to ask anybody for help. You, you don't know whether you can go into this restaurant or whether you can go into that restaurant or whether you can walk up the street without being stopped. It's a, it's a strange feeling. You always get this feeling that you're an alien. This is an altogether new world when he comes over here. It's just like stepping into a foreign country. He doesn't understand it. The city's got a whole different atmosphere than the reservation. There's so many things going on at once, it's really hard to uh, decide where you're going to fit in. Back home, you sort of fit into this easy, slow-moving stream. And here, it's, you know, it's, it's rushing. There's two different cultures. One is that you're quiet, and the other is it's a hustle and a bustle. And uh, you take a person that's not raised up to hustle and bustle, they don't like it. The first evening that I was in the city of Los Angeles, I found it very difficult to sleep, simply because of the foreign sounds that were outside my room. The horns honking, the heavy trucks going by, the many cars passing by my window forced me to stay awake. It wasn't like hearing the birds in, in the evening or hearing the stream that runs by our house or watching the sun go down. Looking out the window, you see the outline of buildings and buildings and buildings. In those buildings, people existed that I knew were not like me. The city has more rules and regulations to it, and you learn to you learn to live with it or move out or suffer. Here in the city, in the Anglo world, everything has got to be did right now. You haven't got time to do it tomorrow. It's got to be done right now, right now. Everything. You punch the clock at a certain time. You get up at a certain time. You go to bed at a certain time. See? Well, on the reservation, we go to bed when it gets dark. And we get up when it gets light. Time is unessential. You start off to go someplace. Well, you know when to... You get there whenever you get there. Okay. There's no hurry to get there. No hurry to get back. She so got all day to get back or all night. Don't make any difference, see? But over here... You've got to be punctual. You've got to punch the clock at a certain time. This is not something that you just zap, put onto somebody. It's, it's a habit pattern. Like everybody starts things at the right times, get up at 7 o'clock, be at work at 8.30, punch out at 4.30, 45 minute ride home, and then you start following this time schedule. You start regimenting yourself into this little box-like mentality, I guess, that America's based on. You got 45 minutes to life each day, two hours to work, another hour to be with your family, and another two hours to sleep. And you start spreading yourself out like that, and then you become more or less a robot. The rules of the city do bother me, because back home, we don't have no rules like that. If you want to cross the street, you cross it right there, and you just go on. You don't have to worry about uh, someone saying, hey, you, uh, what are you doing, you know? If a man told me I was jaywalking, I wouldn't know what he was talking about.
when he first hits the city, he's flustrated. He goes up to the BIA office. They'll give him maybe 50 or $100, and uh, they'll tell him where he can go find lodging. Then just the one he don't know one street from the other. See, they don't have anybody to guide him. They're supposed to, but they don't do it. All right, then he's on his own. He's got to find his way around. We had to come out here to California, and uh, I didn't know what to do. And uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs just brought us out here in a cab, dumped us out, and told us this is where you live. There are 12 people here, and all of them are Indians and uh, different tribes. You have some Cherokees, and you have some Kiowas, and you have some South Dakotans, Sioux. All different types of tribes of Indians are living here. Here, at the boarding house, they have food that I've never heard of before. And then they feed you these Chinese dishes, stuff like that. And I, so I don't eat. Usually supper lasts from 5 o'clock to 6.30. I myself would rather eat alone. But uh, as it is, you can't always have what you want. I miss the meals back home. A lot of the Indians will not say anything about the food. Whether they like it or not, they'll just sit there and eat it. You can't hardly get an Indian to complain about anything. Because, I don't know, he's scared he's going to hurt someone's feelings. And this is the thing that he don't want to do. Because after you've been hurt so long yourself, you know what it feels like to hurt someone's feelings. No one wants to leave home. And if the reservation is their home, that's where they want to stay with friends and relatives and the culture base that they're used to. Indians would not leave the reservation if they had an economic base, because who would leave home? An Indian living on the reservation has very little to do and to do with. There's little opportunity to earn the many material things that, uh, that he reads about and he hears about. And when he goes to town, he's bound to see television, cars, new clothes, and uh, he hears about the cities. People making all of this money, it's flowing. And he comes to the city to become part of that industrial thing, to make money to buy what he wants to buy. He leaves a reservation to find a means of livelihood, to be able to support himself for food, shelter, and clothing. It's very difficult to live on a reservation and be a grown man or grown woman and have to depend on welfare and sit there with nothing to do and no place to go and just existing. No human being wants to exist. It's unhealthy for a man not to be productive and a woman not to be productive. The American Indian comes to the city primarily looking for a dream which is not on the reservation, he knows it isn't there. And too often this dream becomes a nightmare. Many Indians feel disillusioned when they come to the greater Los Angeles area. They, they seem to give up. Sometimes they've lost home ties, the relatives have died off, they don't have a base, and uh, they're a, a family of orphans in an urban area. He's lonesome and he's looking for Indians, as well as looking for some of his own tribes, and he starts walking the streets. He feels 
feels fairly comfortable meeting another Indian. And if that Indian extends his hand in friendship, he's happy because he's found another comrade in the city and then away he goes and he'll end up in a bar on Main Street or in a bar up on West 7th Street or he'll end up going to powwows. He's got to fit into this environment somehow. And he's always going to seek out where the Indians are. ceremonial, but it also is an outgrowth of uh, the old harvest and Thanksgiving celebrations, has uh, from the old days uh, a religious connotation. In the urban areas it's uh, strictly social as most uh, celebrations are on the reservation today. This is where they trade their gossip, Indian culture, tribal customs, or any other tribal business that, that they haven't had time to uh, talk over if they had lived quite a ways from one another. Here in the city, you go to wherever they have these little congregations, and they have them set up a gymnasium or some recreation hall. That's the first disappointment you have. an awful lot of Indians that go there. There's a lot of white people that go and they pretend like they're Indians and they put on costumes and they, you know, dance around. Even though the powwows aren't perfect, I still take my children there because it is, in my way of thinking, Indian. It is still being an Indian and uh, this is what I want my children to be. City powwows are second best to what I find on my own reservation. City powwows are at least an, a, a beginning of identity, a, a way of belonging to something or someone that you don't have with you that you left back home on the reservation. The music, the Indian songs and dances are things that are really a, a heritage. It's, it's something that holds very high to an Indian. He knows these songs are given to him through word of mouth. There is no sheet music. So it's a, it's a privilege and it's an honor for a person to learn these songs from an older person and he himself can carry them on to, to the other people that are interested in singing. Certain songs make me feel very proud that I'm an Indian. When I hear these songs, the feeling I get is one of loneliness sadness because it brings my thoughts back to what it must have been like then when the Indian lived his life as a free agent. He lived in the teepee on the plains, working his way in the fields and trapping for his foods and it was a good life. When I'm out there dancing and doing my best and I hear the Indian music, in my ears and I can hear the drums going and I can hear the singing going and it just all sounds so beautiful and I can look around me and I see other Indian dancers and beautiful feathers and the women in their costumes dancing it it just gives me a feeling of that's what I am and that's this is where I belong After the dance is over, all the young people or the people that like to dance the 49 will get a small drum and they'll dance all night long. Look 
The urban alien goes to a bar to seek out in companionship. They're all just weekend warriors, as they call themselves. You know, they work all week. They're, they're involved in the society which they know they own a part of. They don't feel the, they own a part of it. They know they own a part of it. It reflects no part of their Indian culture. It reflects no part of their Indian feelings. So then it isn't theirs. So like once a week, they'll get together and they'll go down to the pubs and sit around and drink beer, listen to the band, talk and yell at one another and laugh and have a good time. <laughs> Throughout the entire nation, every Indian knows that these bars exist. So if they want to find Indians, that's where they're going to go. That's where they're going to find Indians. The Indian bars are sort of ghettos, you might say. This is the only Indian ghetto, is a bar. The activities in an Indian bar are mostly social, with a certain amount of drinking, with uh, together with an Indian band and some... Uh, uh, white dancing, as they say. Indian bar is where you can meet somebody, well, maybe from back home, and they relate news about relatives. They relate news about who's in town or who's left town. It's, it's somewhere where an Indian can relax without having the inhibitions that, that he may have in a non-Indian bar. In the beginning, the Indian wasn't allowed to drink, so he managed to get it somehow. And in doing this, he drank fast, so he could drink it all before he could get caught. Tense the drunken Indian image. And the home reservation is just not a heck of a lot more to do than drink. So uh, you get in the habit of drinking and you bring your habit to the city with you. You drink in the city too. And it's just a little easier to get. He uh, knows himself a lot better when he's drunk. In other words, he, he just doesn't care where he goes, what he does, or what happens. He hasn't a worry in the world when he's drunk. And the first thing you know, if it's three or four or five of you get in a group, well, then the police come along and pick you up because they know you're going to get in trouble. So as one policeman put it, uh, well, you're not drunk now. You'll be drunk pretty soon. So come on, get in the wagon now and then save me the trouble of picking you up later. A number of the young Indians, when they run out of funds, they see the person next to them who in most cases is generally another Indian who has one or two dollars. They hit him over the head, take his dollar, take his two dollars. Next thing you know, they have a strong arm robbery case against them. Then what happens, this person goes to court, goes to jail, serves some time, comes back out on the street. Now he has another sense of frustration. He goes back down to the bar area again. He gets on what I call a merry-go-round and he gets on this cycle of court, jail, street, maybe a menial job for a few days, get a few dollars, drunk again, and he gets on this cycle. They get the jail record. Later on, it's impossible to find meaningful jobs if you have this jail record. Back home in the reservations, they have what to go, stomp grounds, everyone goes there after the bar's closed. The end in the city, they gather at Johnny Shrimpo down in Maine. And if they're, you're looking for somebody, and you go down there and ask around. If you can get together and you have your fun, and also just, you know, exchange gossip, have something to eat, you know. Like you could go to somebody's house, but then neighbors will complain. So, you know, Johnny's is convenient and everybody knows where it's at, so you go there. We don't know what a lot of people would do without it. Because, like, you can't go out in the hills anymore because it's all private land. You get shot or you get hauled into jail. So it's needed, you know, it serves a purpose. 
I go down there, but I know when to leave. Because the shrimp boat, it's a place where Indians go to let out the roars. And all they got down there is a bunch of drunken Indians that are, are looking for someone to fight. I, I don't want that myself. People used to start coming down about, say, 1.30 and stay all night. And sometimes you have your, uh, your tribal fights. You have your Sioux against, say, your Navajos or everybody against the half-breeds or some, you know, things like this. Sometimes police come down, arrest a whole bunch or just a few. Sometimes they don't come down at all. Well, Indians fight a lot because it's an expression of yourself and saying, well, look, I'm me and I can do this. And I knock three guys down, so that makes me much more of a man than you. And I, and there's a lot of fights. They'll be drinking, then I'll have a fight, and they'll shake hands and you know, drink some more and fight again. Indians usually take violence in a bar as a form of therapy, you might say. They can go out and fight, really, you know, kick each other and everything else. 10, 15 minutes later, you walk in the bar and they're drinking together again. They're happy. It's just working out their frustrations. I'm going to be around my people. I'm going to go wherever they congregate. And if they, they congregated down in the sewer, I'd be down in there with them. Look around. I got his big buildings. And the white man works and lives in it. And yet, this is my land. And yet, where am I at? I'm on Main Street, drinking the bars, you know, talking to other Indians that probably feel the same way, but are not doing anything about it. And I wish I could do something. And where do you really start? There are two images that most white people have of Indians, and one's the romantic uh, man of nature, one who lives with the animals, split through the woods and carries flowers, and the other one is the savage, you know, the bloodthirsty savage who goes around scalping women and children. I believe that the motion picture producer had to have a villain. The most popular villain was the Indian. So you had cowboys and Indians. The Indians were the bad guys. They were just villainous barbarians, and their ways were uncivilized. So here we are faced with three generations of people who believe Indians are wild uh, animals. Like we were reading these history books about these savages that are running around killing people, you know, the pilgrims and all that. And it just gave me a weird feeling to to read about, you know, my own people as, you know, the bad guys, as they always are, like in movies and stuff. Every time kids and people talk about Indians, they always talk about them as in the past, how Indians used to be, and Indians wore feathers, and then they shot arrows. But they never think of them as now. I consider the white image, the white's impression of the American Indian as being merely a novelty item. Less than a hundred years ago, we had our own way of life. We had our own customs, our own religion, our own sense of values. Everything we had was different from the way the white man had when he came here. He looked upon us as savages, and in many ways, we looked upon him as a savage, too. And within a short period of time, we have had to change every one of those values. We've had to change our custom, our way of dressing, our way of thinking, our way of talking. By the time the last Indian was put on a reservation, they were already 
having the rest of the Indians going to boarding schools. And they were punished severely for speaking their languages, for practicing their religions. And they were, you might say, they just beat the Indian into submission. <laughs> The Christian church was perhaps the biggest contributor to the downfall of the Indian as a person and as a race. I think the Christian church has taken a patronizing attitude towards the Indian and has treated him as a child rather than as a man. Akoado 27 verses for Nana Kwashinto. Then says he unto the disciple, Behold thy mother. Jo Kwanadika. We, as a church, want to see the Indian assimilate into the white community completely. Uh, I don't see how the Indian could lose his Indian way. He looks like an Indian, he's able to speak his language. There's no way that I see that he could lose his identity other than his old Indian religions. They might lose this, or their uh, heathen backgrounds, they might lose this. But I, as a missionary, think this is good because the Indian religions and their old Indian ways and superstitions have a tendency to keep the Indian in fear and keep him down. After we accepted Christ as our Savior, our whole life has been different. And to me, church is a way of life, and it's a part of me. I couldn't live without God. I was drinking pretty heavy when I come out here really living up to what the Anglo says we are, a bunch of drunken bums and drunken Indians and all that. So I, I turned over a new leaf and I accepted Jesus Christ and become a, a, to live a Christian life. Now I'm glad this morning, Indian friend, that God knows just what we can take if we're determined we're going to serve the Lord. But we need to be determined we need to make up our minds that that's what we're going to do. We're going to serve God. If we don't have Personally, I like to go up to the hills every now and then and sit there all by myself and meditate and think of the old religious ways of the American Indian. And in talking to the Great Spirit by yourself, you, you can't hardly do that in the city. He was determined that he was going to... I think that the Christian church has been one of the factors that have led to the reservation system, to the economic downfall of the Indian. And I think that more and more as Indians become aware of their Indianness, they will get away from the Christian church, go back to the old traditional religion of worshiping the earth and Mother Nature. Ours is an elemental force, a belief that we are one with nature's elements. He no more than got through telling Job That's why most Indians take pride in being named after certain animals, certain totem animals, or certain objects of nature, rocks, water, clouds, because we are one with nature. We're not above nature. And any person who believes this is truly a pagan, is truly a heathen, who thinks that he is above what the force of life has created. This is primarily why I say that Christianity has done us no good. It has really made a wreck of the American Indian people. Indian religions and Christ does not mix because we're contrary. Uh, we believe the Bible says no other gods before us, and we realize that the Indians look to the medicine man almost as a god. So we uh, do our best to lead them to Christ, who is the answer to every situation they can come into. elastic or the Christian churches wouldn't have gotten here in the first place. The preacher is the one that has to realize that that the Indian religion is not pagan, is not a hostile uh, devil-founded religion, but probably a, a more pure religion than uh, what they brought over with the uh, good book.
Christianity itself, I think, has done more harm to the Indian than good in the try to convert the heathen without realizing who really was the heathen. They've destroyed the quality of being Indian, the quality of even aspiring to be an Indian. Maybe it's prepared an Indian to be a callous, cold, brown, white man. If this is good, then they're doing some good. Being Indian is being aware that you're descendants of a defeated people and that your conquerors are roaming all around you. The descendants of the conquerors are here and their ways are all over the place. You gotta make up your minds because like whether you're gonna be Indian and be proud that you're Indian or whether you're gonna sell out and become an apple and cut your hair and live on the other side of the track. And then you start wondering if the Indians were so good and they said what a superior way of life, you know, well, how come the white people beat them? And then you start thinking, well, maybe they weren't that good. And you see your grandfather and listen to people tell about your grandfather and what he did. And you say, uh, if you were so great, well, how come we're still not living that way? You know, how come we have to live like this? My brother stays with me, me and my family. I'd rather have him with me than have him go out somewhere and live by himself. He's really lonely for home. He doesn't really like it here and he misses the whole family and uh, he would like to go back. My sister doesn't talk about it much but uh, she is lonely too and uh, we just stay in our little apartment and watch TV because that's about the only thing to do around here. It's difficult to, to be Indian or to live Indian in the city, especially for someone like myself who's lived in the city all my life. I had to go to my grandfather and ask him, how was it or how is it? And he'd sit down and tell me stories and how it is and how it was. And I would think it was beautiful. And I wondered, why are we here then? Why are we living in this society when it was so beautiful, the way you lived, Grandpa? Well, after my grandfather died, there was no one to turn to, no one to find out how did we live, how did Indians live. And so now my granddaughter has no one to go to. Where would she go? She'd have to go to the books, and they're distorted. So I have to try to learn as much as I can so that I can teach her so it won't be lost because it's, it's lost after the old people are gone, it's lost. I want my children to be proud that they are Indians, proud of their Indian blood and uh, realizing it all the while that they are not going to be uh, all Indian. They're going to be a city Indian. By the time the child is a teenager, he doesn't know what to be or what to look for or towards. What shall I be? Shall I be half Indian and half white? Or should I be all white and, or should I be all Indian? Come on, run. <laughs> there is the generation of Indians which has been born in the city. This generation does not know the true Indian way of life, the reservation life. They know they're Indian. Generally speaking, they want to be Indian. They have not had the upbringing and the background of the reservation Indian. I would have to say that I am assimilated into society. I, at times, feel a personal loss. The fact that I do not have the, the background and the cultures and the traditions and have not been able to maintain them. I do, at times, feel a personal sense of loss.
if I don't watch myself, my activities, it would be easy to slide into this urban life and lose all sense of tradition and culture and Indianism. I feel that if I don't watch myself, that I could just uh, evaporate into this city and become a non-entity. An Indian who comes to a city has already made a choice to assimilate into the society. He's leaving a way of life with which he has grown up. He has to take on an entirely new way of life. So when Indians do come to the cities, they are already in the first stages of assimilation. If the American Indian decides that it's not important enough for him to identify himself as an Indian, to learn his language, to learn his custom, his dances, and whatever pride it is in being an Indian, then he becomes just a, a brown American, one that has no background. And I feel sorry for anybody who would want to live that way because everybody has got to have pride in their heritage and in their culture. Some members of the Indian community may refer to me as an apple. An apple is a person who is red on the outside and white on the inside. Uh, this term would be applied to one who they believe is more white than he is Indian. And this is a sellout. He's white thinking on the inside, but he looks Indian. In the same way with a Nabisco, it's a chocolate Nabisco cookie. It's brown on the outside, it's white on the inside. Same with a coconut. It's brown on the outside and white on the inside. I think that uh, all urban Indians are to some degree or other Uncle Tom's or Apple's. He wants a TV, he wants a new car, he wants a home. Maybe he wants a white wife. And that's the ultimate. I personally see nothing wrong with interracial marriage between Indians and non-Indians. Uh, I personally am married to a white woman. I know many Indians who are married to white people. I know many who are married to Indians. I think this is a thing for the, for the individual person. I feel that Indians should marry their own people, not because I'm prejudiced, but because there's so few of us. I see my kids marrying into the white race, and then uh, their kids will also marry into the possibly a, a white race again, and eventually uh, you become a quarter, and then you become an eighth, and then you become a 32nd, and by that time uh, you are no longer an Indian. I think my family is seeing the last phase of pure Indianness. I'm sure that my sister and I will marry non-Indians. I'm sure that the rest of my relatives of marrying age will marry non-Indians. Or if they marry Indians, they won't be full-blooded Indians. Which is unfortunate because it, it's going to be an end of Indianness in my family. But it's inevitable. In coming to the city, I think the Indian realizes that eventually the race will come to an end because the city is not consistent with traditional Indian life. I think by assimilation into the white world, we're going to see the decline and perhaps even the end of Indians as a nation. Well, I, I feel the, the major role of the Bureau of Indian Affairs is assimilation. I think their plan is to get the Indian, especially the young ones, off the reservation and bring them into the city so they'll get a taste of city life and hopefully the Indian will want to stay if he gets a job because he doesn't have anything back in the reservation. It would be cultural genocide for the government to insist on total assimilation of the Indian into the society. I can't express strongly enough how much of a catastrophe it would be if the Indian people are allowed to just vanish into society at large and become another part of that faceless society.
when you talk about an Indian, you talk about land. It's more than just a piece of paper. It's a whole tradition. It's a whole history. The Indian lands are the basis of the Indian people. The past history of the Indians has been interwoven with the land. It was their church, their means of livelihood, and uh, their entire life was one with the land. And that is why Indian lands mean so much to the Indian people today. Well, reservation land is a piece of geography that identifies a people. And the Indian being the original American needs some real estate to call his home. I can sympathize and I feel empathy for those who believe that the land is part of the culture. But I think that the land is only an economic base. Too many people devote 100% of their time to worrying about the land that the Indian lost. It's lost, it's gone, and it's never coming back. There's no way that the white man is going to give the land back to the Indian. I think we should just accept the fact that the land is gone and use what's ever left to develop a good, strong economic base. We don't want economic development on our reservations because economic development is industrial development. And that's the last thing we need here on the reservation is a city and its industry because it'll just destroy us. It's rather difficult to keep your Indian identity in the city because you're far removed from your homeland. Every time you get lonesome, you jump in the car and go home for a while and then you come back and start all over again. Some Indians go four, five, six, or seven times to the reservation, which may be 15 or 1,700 miles away. Spend a short time and back to the city and earn some more money so you can go again. To go back to the reservation is to give up. It's to go back to the old way of life. The old way of life may have been romantic, but it's not realistic in our day. I don't think any Indian in truth that was born on a reservation or in an Indian community calls Los Angeles his home. He calls his cultural base, his reservation, and his Indian community where he was born and originated home. Even a landless Indian has a feeling towards the land that he or his forefathers may have come from. And for an Indian to lose that feeling, he loses a very important part of his Indianness. The land to an American Indian is a heartbeat. It's a lifeblood. The giving factor that makes us breathe and look forward to tomorrow. And when, when that land has been taken away from us, we feel like life is gone. If the land is not developed and the young people keep coming out into the city, the old, they, they will just utterly die on the reservation. That's their home. They'll die there and the Indian nation will be destroyed. There will be no, no land, no home, no nothing. Just the young in the city assimilating and the old dead. When you take the land away from the Indian, you've taken away half of his life. He doesn't have any respect for anything else. See, the land and the sky, the open space, that's his life. And when you take that away from him, you've killed him. I don't really feel that I'm part of the end of the Indians as a race. I think they started to end 150 years ago when the reservation system was initiated to take the Indian away from his traditional way of life, living free, living in a tribal society, shooting game for his food. That's the traditional Indian life. The reservation system ended that. I don't think that I'm seeing the beginning of the end. I think I'm approaching the end of the end. Now that you're wondering 
how can it be real that the ones you've called colorful, noble, and proud in your school propaganda, they starve in their splendor. You've asked for my comment, I simply will render. My country, tis of thy people you're dying. Hear how the bargain was made for the West with her shivering children in zero degrees. Blankets for your land, so the treaties attest. Well, blankets for land is a bargain indeed. And the blankets were those Uncle Sam had collected from smallpox disease, dying soldiers that day. And the tribes were wiped out, and the history books censored. A hundred years of your statesmen have felt it's better this way. Yet a few of the conquered have somehow survived their blood runs the redder though jeans have been paled from the grand canyon's caverns to craven sad hills the wounded the losers the robbed sing their tale from los angeles county to upstate new york the white nation fattens while others grow lean Oh, the tricked and evicted, they know what I mean My country is of thy people, you're dying The past, it just crumbled, the future just threatens our lifeblood shut up in your chemical tanks and now here you come bill of sale in your hand and surprise in your eyes that we're lacking in thanks for the blessings of civilization you brought us the lessons you've taught us the ruin you brought us oh see what our trust in america's bought us my country is of thy people you're dying my country is of